Okay, so we're going to talk about the Juxtalone project, and we've got this wonderful tagline, From Practice Into Practice. That came from our first annual review with the EU, which went very well, not that I want to brag or anything. And uh, I'm Jill Clough, and this is Anne Adams. I'm the researcher, and uh, that's right, it's the other way around. She's, she's more important than I am, she's the PI. So, um, outline. What we're going to do is, is quickly talk a bit about um, how we got the project off the ground and uh, the rationale behind why we put together the project. Um, then we're going to talk about some of the challenges in, in, in reaching a shared understanding of what the project was all about between us and, and the partners, because uh, when you do put together a project of this nature, which is quite complex, uh, it, it, <laughs> there are a lot of problems in, in reaching that understanding. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, the, the Juxtalem process that we've come up with, um, the findings from uh, the first year's work, um, which revolve around the taxonomy of threshold concepts. And, and finally, we're going to talk about um, engagement and how we disseminate and engage with the various stakeholders. So over to Anne. Okay. So it's sort of engagement at different levels. There's engagement with the partners within the regards to the project and the starting and, and uh, sort of, it's a bit like yours, Trevor, when you were talking about it, like getting going and getting everybody engaged. And then there's the engagement and concepts of engagement um, with, uh, with the public and schools, etc. Okay, so moving on. So um, we originally had um, a, a partner meeting. Well, we got some partners across and had a meeting in uh, the OU in, December, in September. And the call was 4 um, February. And that was essential to just try and get people on the same uh, page. Um, and harder than you'd think, actually. I had a whole set of objectives and expectations for that meeting. And just having us on the same page was hard enough to get <laughs> through. Eileen, you were at that one, weren't you? And Yes. <laughs> and uh, Jill, you were, were you there? And no. I think Tim was there. Yeah, okay. So we, we discussed objectives and expectations. Um, and actually, although I was sort of thinking, oh, we should have had more of an idea and allocated tasks to everybody, um, what we did end up was with a theme of performance, which was pretty useful to tie us together and has been very unifying in keeping us going. This whole, just, just having a theme is important and everybody understanding that theme. Um, then we had a, an EU, a, 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 um, um, in that meeting we had a discussion about resources and what we could do and then we could scope expectations of what different partners thought could come from this. And that was, uh, like I said, harder than I'd initially thought. One of the things that was driving us was the fact that um, in STEM, um, this, the call was asking for instilling STEM curiosity and understanding. Basically, the EU want everything. They wanted to get everybody engaged and they wanted to increase understanding for students and that to be personalised understanding as well as we've sort of like stretched it a bit towards um, group um, video making, but personal understanding being progressed and we can identify that and track that through threshold concepts. But one of the things that sort of drove us originally was looking at um, the previous research on e-learning, mobile e-learning and STEM e-learning and gaming e-learning, I did a quick search and, and found that actually when you looked at all of the, the TEL research that we've done in that area, just looking at the images, it was very focused on one person and the technology rather than the process. And I think the whole thing of performance made us start to think about the, the, the process more um, of... Uh, of actually juxtaposing understanding, and that's the underpinning of this project, is about not just supporting understanding of concepts, yes, but actually through juxtaposing and then reflecting on that understanding in a creative way. And it's the creative performance that's sort of driving the whole project forward. So that it's sustainable and scalable was also one of the things that we have been... And actually, with regard to the partners, this is one of the sort of um, tensions <laughs> that we're coming up against now is that um, with a research project, innovating and um, advancing what they think are innovative and uh, the things that they're eager to advance on, whilst also making it sustainable and scalable in a school system is really hard. Mainly, a lot of tell has died. It sort of like says sustainable, scalable is to produce... 
um, lesson plans. Oh yeah, we do all the fun, exciting stuff and then throw out some lesson plans and somehow that'll be sustainable and uh, scalable. But actually, if you go into the schools and look at how teachers teach, um, as one of the teachers said to us, we don't even want to write lesson plans, let alone look at ones that have been created by someone else and re-employ them. So we had to sort of really go back and review it. But we still keep coming up against this sort of uh, this innovating and what is theoretically a and conceptually good to what practically can be applied and continually trying to make those connections between the two is easier said than done. So anyway, we're looking at for Juxta Learn in schools, universities, colleges and communities, this juxtaposed understanding um, and to create curiosity. And the main thing that was driving us was through um, that what well, was driving the core was that the EU are worried that not enough young people are taking science or technology at school. Those of you from science and technology know this. Um, but that um, actually, once it ceases to be compulsory. But in fact, at the same time, media studies is massively increasing. Lots of, people, lots of students are taking creative and media study courses. Um, and specifically, when I started writing the bid, there is a large number of... Um, video um, online resources, the amount of use of video, the reuse of video is massive. Netflix was just sort of starting and it's getting massive. Um, and the um, external to the, um, to the US, the majority of um, YouTube videos are external. They're all viewed by America, but the majority of them are actually produced outside of America, which is quite surprising to me. I've got the stats that I threw into the bid on that. So anyway, we, we decided to take this um, creative video making as an approach to this um, to instill curiosity in science and technology and a deeper understanding of science and technology. But I think one of the things we came up with at the beginning was that we didn't want to just create videos that communicate understanding. And we still keep having this... Um, uh, clash with some people thinking, oh yes, no, but you've got to, especially in science, create good quality videos, the sort of BBC video thing of this being an accurate video, accurate representations of understanding. And a lot of what has been driving us is actually the process of video making and sharing, supporting that reflective process of understanding, and that being almost as useful as the video in itself, if more useful than the video itself. So it would be nice if there are useful, um, valid uh, videos at the end, but it's the process of creating the video that's uh, absolutely useful for the students because it supports that understanding and reflective learning of threshold concepts. We did a run-through um, a couple of months ago with one of the schools, and I must say that the teacher um, that we've been working with, who's heading up the science, said to us, said to me particularly, he said, you know, when you first came to me with this idea, you know, and said, I thought it was a pile of bleep. <laughs> but, but actually, he said, it really worked. I couldn't believe it. The students, I thought, they'd just go off and have videos and have fun. But actually, they were coming up to me and saying, well, actually, if I take this and I try translation, if I do this with it, is it accurate, sir? If I, if I apply it this way, is it still what it's supposed to be? They were, he said they were asking all those probing questions. And in fact, Birmingham, who do the video editing uh, with the schools, said that they, they commented in the review that at one point the teacher realised that the students had totally misunderstood some aspect of tritation or avogadro, I can't remember what. And he did an impromptu lesson with them there and then during the video making process because he hadn't realised that they misunderstood it. And he said um, at the end, he so said, I was amazed, actually, that not only did it help them and to sort of come and ask the right questions and be creative with them, but actually, at the end, I realised through the videos they've made several things that they totally misunderstood. And I hadn't realised, I thought we'd all, we all grasped it, and they were all on the same page, but I realise now I have to go to that part of tritation or whatever it was, because they just haven't understood it. I've got to go back again and do that. So it was useful for him to reflect on their progression as well. Um, so I think he's, he was so bowed over, bowed over by it that he started up with the drama teacher a chemistry video making club. 
in the, <laughs> in the school. And the drama teacher, obviously super eager about the yes. fact that he can get into all of these classes and have a major impact, wants to have this across the whole school, creative video making to understand maths and all these different things. So I think the power of the impact of this is quite amazing. Okay, so moving on to the detail, the background towards this. So we've used as a focus for this threshold concepts. So I'm not too certain about how everybody's understanding of threshold concepts. Basically, um, this came up from a research project by Meyer and Land. First one was in 2003. And um, it's about, so a threshold concept is, and this is very simplistic for those who know about threshold concepts, um, is a sort of like gatekeeping concept. It's a central concept that has many other concepts related to it. It's something without which the, prog the, uh, the learner can't progress, that's why it's that gate. Uh, it's a sort of portal they talk about to, once you open it, it opens to a whole load of new and previously inaccessible ways of thinking about something and produces these sort of light bulb moments um, of this transformed way of understanding or interpreting. It also connects to, and actually um, teachers sort of quite like this idea of this troublesome knowledge. Sometimes it's got counterintuitive knowledge in it. But basically, you, when you talk to the teachers about this, they really latch on to threshold concepts. It's become a bit pedagogically, um, some people don't like that. Some of the underpinning of it and the theories have been debated. But teachers absolutely love the idea of this sort of trouble, this, this central threshold concept. Mainly, if you say to them, it's one of these concepts you know when you're teaching that the students are coming up to, and if you could just get them over that concept, it'll open up a whole load, load of other related concepts that are related to it. And, it. and you know when you've taught or you've uh, written a course that you've got this, this concept that's a, it's a, no, it's a problem one. And it's the one that all the students, when they come to do an exam, will have a problem with. And they, having the teachers focus on those threshold concepts and break them down to support the students in creating videos around it gives that structure and scaffold to the reflective and, and uh, creative process. Um, okay, so there are features of a uh, threshold concept, the fact that it's transformative, irreversible, integrative, bounded, troublesome. It doesn't necessarily have to have all of these, but there are elements of it. Okay. These are the learning pathways of different students, basically, through internalising a concept. And this was ever so useful to explain to the teachers about a threshold concept. So um, this is a sort of like pathway of a student. You can see where you've, <laughs> you've taught. You know those students that go round and round in circles of, yeah, no, I've got that, no, I haven't. Oh, wait a minute, and they go backwards and forwards. Um, round and round themselves until they internalise that concept. Um, this is um, a student who gets halfway through and then just gives up. This is one of the sort of <coughs> ideal pathways where they're having problems and then they, they carry on forwards, but they you know keep having stops and starts and going up and down. This one looks like it would be a student who has an ideal internalising. They just internalise it. But there's a lot of literature about conceptual understanding and mimicry. And this is, I think, a major problem when you're teaching, writing courses, that you see when it comes to exams. But these are the students, a lot of them, I think this might relate to drop-off rates. <laughs> Those that go, yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. Variables, yes. No, I understand whatever this, you know, tritation. And they just skim through, assuming they understand it, or they're just mimicking an understanding, regurgitating, taking the words that are in the book, taking them and then they just regurgitate them back at you. But actually, they just have this surface understanding. And they're the ones that we're trying to at least get them to do a bit more of this, or at least have a structured approach to this, where they actually reflect and think, do I understand it? And they do a bit more of an up and down, thinking on what they're rather than just skimming through, thinking I just need to take the stuff from the book, stick it in my head and answer the questions in the exam, and then they get unstuck. And we're doing that through video making 
as I've mentioned before, I won't go into too much detail here because you want to get on to some of the fun stuff. Um, so way, way back, Bandura talked about uh, televised modelling and it being intrinsically rewarding. And you see that with the students, them being motivated to create these videos and mainly be creative in science. And you can see them just having fun with it and, and laughing with it in a way that uh, I'm, I'm not certain that they always do in science classes. <laughs> um, and they have um, this sort of like... It, as, as Marowitz talks about, uh, transformative learning through discovery and the use of metaphors. So the whole point with juxtalearn is it's actually juxtaposing and you compare with current understanding. So rather than taking an understanding and applying it in different situations, you have the standard approach, the thing that's going to be in the exam that's presented to the students, and then they take it and they play with it. They juxtapose it, they create metaphors around it and play with it. Which is where the students who went back to the teachers and said, well, if I do this with translation, is it right? But at least they're asking those questions. And what we were finding with the ones that just skimmed through is they just go, oh yes, no, I just need to take stuff in the book, that standard understanding, stick it in my head and regurgitate it back to them. They're actually owning it, putting it into their own models of understanding. Um, they're reflecting on it, as Jew would say, and there's been a lot of um, um, literature recently on video making and, funnily enough, editing, how editing support uh, videos supports reflection. In each stage of the process, in just now, we've been identifying how it supports <coughs> students in reflecting on what they're doing and the deeper understanding that fits in there. Um, to support them sort of um, comparing and contrasting and lateral thinking. Sorry, now we're going to some more fun stuff. <laughs> so that's the underpinning understanding of it. Right, so as we said right at the beginning, one of the first challenges we faced was to um, reach a shared understanding of the project amongst the partners in the project as well as uh, with the teachers. And so since this is a, a sort of a performative video um, based project, um, logically we decided we'd use video to um, share our understanding and express our understanding. So, um, right at the uh, very early meeting, we all made a video, and this is our video. Part of our video. Part of our video. It's only a short bit. Oopsie, that's not, that's not it at all. That is the next slide. So, that's it there. Just to learn could be part of their everyday teaching. We made pen casts of 
the examples we use as our teaching and put them online for the students to look at whatever they want. Fairly sort of. That <laughs> 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 was a fairly whistle st whistle stop tour through the early early months of the project, um, but it, it's actually an accurate representation of what did indeed happen when we all met with the partners. We had partners saying, "Oh, you know, work package two. Why aren't you science experts? You know, you need to understand the threshold concepts in order to be able to correctly define them." And uh, then there were others who said. Well, how can you be sure that the students are producing videos that are absolutely accurate? But as Anne pointed out earlier, that's not the point. The point is, it's all part of a process. The process of reflection, reflective learning, peer learning, and learning through interactions, obviously, with the teacher and with others. So, apart from making cool videos of talking teddies uh, for each other, um, I also tried to map out my understanding of the juxtalearn process as it had been explained in the bid. And I also um, tried to map out where the different um, partners fitted in. Um, and I came up with this, which, you know, little circular process. Um, and we got a, a graphic designer looked at that from the Spanish um, partners who are Work Package 6. And they turned it into this, which is very much more illustrative of the Juxtalum process. So I'm going to run you through the full Juxtalum process using this graphic. Um, we've not implemented it yet, and I'll explain where all the different bits of um, research fit in. So stage one is identify. And this is where we support the teachers in identifying the threshold concepts. To do this, we provide them with a taxonomy tool. Um, which um, we have researched the threshold concept. We've worked with the teachers, we've worked with associate lecturers from TU100, we've worked with academic subject matter experts such as uh, <laughs> Paul and Chris, and we've broken down the whole threshold concept thing into a series of categories which we call the taxonomy. Because what we found is that teachers, they say, I just don't understand why they don't understand. They, they talk to their students, they think they're communicating, the students think they've understood as well, as in, as in your diagram. Um, but when it comes to the exam, the students fall down and they don't know why. So identifying the elements that, that comprise, the, that the threshold concept consists of is quite important. So having broken down the threshold concept into its constituent parts, they then... Um, move on to the demonstrate stage, if they want to, and that is what was referred to in the video, the standard teaching activity. All teachers, when they're working with students who are struggling with these difficult, tricky-to-learn topics, um, have little techniques they use. They may stand with the student and they'll explain it and they'll draw something out. So this is where the creation of the pencast, it captures the teacher's expertise in a playable format. It doesn't have to be a pencast. It could be a YouTube video, or whatever the teachers are comfortable with using. We've got, uh, they've created a few and, and they work very well. Interpret is the next stage and this is where the teachers and the students work together using the taxonomy um, and having fed it through into a diagnostic quiz to identify the gaps in the student's understanding. It's not a, a pre-test and a post-test. It's just a diagnostic tool so that, for example, if they have a class of students and they work through the quiz, um, and we're talking about moles, let's stick with moles. Chemistry moles is a threshold concept. They may find that some students are very, very comfortable with the practical aspect of titration, um, but they're not so comfortable with maths and powers in maths and just doing the calculations. Another student might be more comfortable with the mathematical side, but just be hopeless at understanding gases. So, they can group the students into groupings of four students to work together. So you get an element of peer learning in the next stage, which is the perform and edit stage. stage. Those two stages um, come quite close together. Perform is where the students go away into groups. They storyboard their um, idea for a performative video to illustrate their understanding of the threshold concept. In this case, let's call, say it's moles. Now, throughout this, this, this whole process is underpinned by the Juxtalearn web space. So, the 
taxonomy tool is in the web space, so as the teacher identifies the threshold concept and tags it with the stumbling blocks, the teachers came up with this term because the students trip over stumbling blocks, so the threshold concept breaks down into stumbling blocks and those pass through the subsequent stages so that at the quiz stage, the quiz is linked back to the stumbling blocks so that it can be weighted so that the questions, they may seem superficially simple, but using the taxonomy, you can actually drill down to this question looks simple, but actually it's hitting several of the stumbling blocks that the teachers have identified in this threshold concept. So it should be marked such, and, and that gives you a more accurate representation of the student's understanding. Feeds through to the uh, performance and editing side. The project is this sort of catwalk technology approach. So we're doing the innovative stuff, but this will be scalable for the schools so that it doesn't need tabletops. We're using tabletop editing. So one of our partners is de designing an editing uh, tool for the tabletop, which feeds through the threshold concept and the stumbling blocks linked to the threshold concept, such that the students, when they've shot their video, they storyboard it first. Then when they've shot it, they can make sure that the scenes in the video address the various stumbling blocks of the threshold concept, thereby avoiding the pitfall identified by everybody you talk to, that if you let students loose with some video cameras and an idea, they might go off and they might just produce fun videos that don't address the topic. It's very important to always be tied back to the threshold concept. Having performed, having created their video, edited their video so that it's, uh, they're happy with it, you then get on to the sharing point of the process. Now, work on the sharing has been conducted in parallel with our work on the pedagogy, but this is the sort of stage we're at at the moment. We're trying to tie everything in together. So students initially will be sharing it within their group, then within their class, with their teacher, then within their school. But ultimately, um, the, the partner responsible for the sort of wider sharing is, is large screen displays. So the idea is that there'll be network large screen displays so that the videos are up for other students to see. And displays such as that, that's typically a sort of display a school might have. And students can go by it, watch the video. Um, and the large screen displays people have actually come up with an idea of reusing the, the quiz questions that we've developed up in the demonstrate section, popping them up again linked to the large screen display, to the video that's currently being displayed. So their students can sort of, oh, this is interesting. And theoretically on their mobiles, um, answer a few questions, but just engage with the video. More importantly, and part of the project, is the discuss, the feedback stage. Because it's not just a learning uh, tool for the students in the class. Ideally, it should be a, a way of engaging other students and getting feedback. And the students who created the video can learn from the feedback from other students, and the students giving feedback can also learn from watching the video. So it's, it's a whole process. And then ultimately, at the end, we get to the review stage where the students in the original class and their teacher will review um, their learning, review the videos, and discuss. And you can, at any point, you can sort of go back and repeat any of these stages. It's not, it doesn't have to be a linear process, which is why it's a sort of a, a squished circle. There's some, some sorry. Yes, yeah, do, <laughs> do come on in. There's some interesting um, issues that started to come up with different forms of sharing. So the students were um, in one of the trials, so yep. we were happy to share the videos, but not comments. They got funny about it was sensitive, the commenting. Um, I think we're, where we're trying to deal with that is to have the, the comments scaffolded around the threshold comments, uh, the threshold uh, um, concepts. And I think the thing is that what, often what happens in, say, YouTube videos is you get this spiralling of them going, oh, yeah, no, I thought the hat was fun or, um, or they, they just come out with very emotive and random comments and so it becomes quite an emotional thing the commenting so we're trying to sort of keep it very focused on the, the, um, the topic area but also through the um, performance palette try to keep them commenting about the engagement of the video like I like that but actually structure their feedback so it doesn't become random free-for-all just battering back and forth but they are very aware of I suppose that youngsters are very in the social media environments so they're very conscious of that but also the whole thing of the large screen displays wasn't quite how we thought it would be interpreted the teachers were very conscious about having control over the information on large screen displays and it became almost more sensitive putting it on a large screen display in a school than on the internet they were like fine yes it can go on the web but actually we need to really think about it if it goes on a display at the school 
So it's become, um, sort of later on, the displays have become after it's gone up into the web and SharePoint um, mm. commented on. Sorry. Well, that's, no, that's fine. It's good. good. It's, it's not, it's, those are things that you don't anticipate, but then uh, that's why it's research. You know, you can't, it's, it's not all, all sort of fixed. So... And this slide is optimistically entitled Findings. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're only a year in. <laughs> only a year into the project. So uh, we in Work Package 2, which is the pedagogical work package, have had, um, we've conducted a lot of uh, several workshops with teachers and one with students. We've also worked with Work Package 3, which is the performance work package, all about creative performance, and Work Package 4, which is the tabletop editing work package, to host another workshop at the school where the students used the, we called it the pedagogical palette and the performance palette. So the pedagogical palette contains all the stumbling blocks that the teacher identified with the threshold concept and the performance palette contains um, guidelines on performance, the type of genre, uh, various sort of helpful things for creating a video performance because obviously teachers aren't experienced in creating videos. Yeah. This became, I think this is something, I don't know if it's something particular to science, but several of the science teachers got very sort of, um, and, and people from science got very wound up about the idea that students, what if they aren't creative? Uh, what if they can't create a, a video around moles or whatever? And they were very nervous about that. And I... I, I don't know, it's something that in, say, English, they don't worry mm. about, but they did. And in fact, uh, having them working in groups, it sort of counteracted. It also allowed for the fact that some students didn't want to be in front of the video. They could take on different roles, and that's what the performance palette supports, the different mm. roles, but also supports them working together to create this creative thing rather than just being individually which is what we were originally going to do. <laughs> it's probably part of the reason that the drama teacher is so engaged, because the performance palette helps explain and engage students with the idea of creating a video performance and learning about the, the, the role of the person behind the scenes as well as the roles of those in front. But anyway, back to the taxonomy and the threshold concepts. Um, we came up with a taxonomy. Now, this is... You're not doing mom's video. Yes, that's later. Okay. <laughs> There's another video coming. You'll really like it, but you'll have to wait. Um, this is a graphical representation of the taxonomy we came up with, and we worked with the teachers on this. And we came up with a table, which is quite difficult to fit on a screen, basically. And it's also, um, the teachers found it quite difficult to engage with. So we've, um, we've developed it into this, this graphic, and then we're creating a WordPress app that will fit into the Juxtalearn web space and kind of support the teachers through all these stages. But basically, the teachers come along, they say, right, my student has a problem with um, moles. Uh, they, they, they don't understand, they can't grasp the idea of gases um, and, and the different volumes of gases. So, um, and with all, all the sorts of, so it starts from an example of what the students have problems with. And is it, you know, a terminology? That is the first um, interface between the student and the topic. Is it uh, scientific use of everyday terminology, which is often the case? Sometimes one term is used to represent many scientific concepts, and volts springs to mind, she said, looking directly at Paul. Um, I looked it up on Wikipedia, and there are three different definitions of volts in t different terms. So depending on the context, the word volt and voltage means you know, slightly different things. I find it confusing. Um, and then one concept can have many different scientific names, again, according to con context. And teachers are domain experts, so they're within this, this domain. To them, it's perfectly normal. And sometimes the student says, yes, I've understood, but they haven't. They've, they've got different understandings of the same words. Yeah. No, sorry, that's where you get the, the students sort of like saying, oh, yeah, no, I understand it. And they're using the term variable or volts or whatever or that they've learnt from somewhere else, and they're just skimming through, going, yeah, 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 no, I understand it. And it's at that, that terminology level. And what we've helped, done with the teachers is actually got them to reflect on, and actually a lot of this ended up being a lot more time with the teachers than we thought it would need to be, but actually to reflect on and unpick about what are these threshold concepts and what are the problems within these threshold concepts. And the first barrier seems to be it's to do with the terminology. The teachers are talking to them at one point, and usually when you become a scientist, you become a computer scientist, 
And this is worse in physics. Physicists are worse because <laughs> they combine everything, maths language and normal language and everyday language and uh, science language. And their use you, of metaphors is yeah. just to <laughs> seem to be believed. But you become this scientist or a computer scientist and, and you use terminology in a certain way and the student comes along reading the book thinking they've understood it but it's mixed up with a lot of other understanding that they have. So they think they're communicating, but they're communicating at different levels and it doesn't really get unpicked that they're, until you get to the exam that they're talking at cross purposes or through doing something like a creative playing with it. So there's the terminology, but then there's another layer beneath the terminology. So it may not be a terminology problem. It could be to do with their mental models that they've built up around the mm. concept. Yes. <laughs> so um, this layer is, is still in a state of flux, but in its sort of current state, um, it's, it's, it's around the concepts. And uh, we've got broken it down into essential concepts and incomplete pre-knowledge. Perhaps not very good, good terms, but um, incomplete pre-knowledge, it could be sort of underpinning concepts that the student lacks. And a simple one is very often maths. Students go into chemistry or physics or biology, even biology, statistics is really important. Um, but because they're not confident in their underpinning maths knowledge isn't up to scratch, they struggle with the concept. And some of the examples of the problems their students have that teachers have given us relate to maths, so they pop into that bit. Um, another uh, interesting underpinning concept that problem that, that's been pointed out to us is that students, um, say at primary school, are often taught science in a simplistic way that is, enables them to understand at that level, but then when they move on to the more senior levels, they have to effectively unlearn what they've been taught before. And they, they often feel, you know, why, did you, why were we taught this? This is what, you know, Mrs. McGalty in, in junior school said, and, and, you know, that was right. This, this doesn't match that. So you've got these underpinning, underpinning ideas that the students have got embedded within them that uh, have to be unlearned. And then there's the, the idea of complementary concepts. Well, with every threshold concept, there are some concepts alongside it that you need to understand, and it's assumed you understand. And um, a sort of a higher education one is a genetic drift. That was one of the first ones pointed out to us. It's such a complicated concept, it's not being taught anymore, which is why we haven't included it in this research. But in order to understand genetic drift, it is assumed that you already understand natural selection because genetic drift makes no sense unless you understand natural selection. If your understanding of natural selection is flawed, then you're going to have problems with genetic drift. Um, and indeed, as you learn genetic drift, you also have to learn about the causes of genetic drift, which include founder effect and bottlenecking. Um, and these are, these are extra things that you have to learn. So this is the conceptual layer. So, so there's, there's the way of communicating between the teacher and the student that's the terminology. There's the model that they build up of from, based on their pre-knowledge and the current concepts that they're building together, which will always have gaps in it to some extent. Sometimes those gaps are, are, are sort of um, are reasonably mapped across and can be filled in with the new knowledge that they're building, or sometimes those gaps in their understanding fall them down into intuitive beliefs. And this is where they start to fill in those gaps in their understanding with, um, with, with <laughs> these conceptual constructs, which are the assumed relationships, causal relationships. And those are the things that start to really unpick when you're teaching them a complex concept. Because if they are, their underlying intuitive beliefs that they're relying on are completely contrary to everything you're building up, they start to build elaborate maps of why what you're saying to them works based on some of these intuitive beliefs yes. to be a nightmare. And we've got some examples of these. I mean, Shanann has, has brought one up. She's been looking into the threshold concept cells. And the one that you mentioned is that students often think that um, larger animals are made up of bigger cells than smaller animals. It's perfectly logical to them because, you know, bigger people have got, you know, longer arms and, and are just larger than smaller people. Cause and effect. Yeah, so, so it's a sort of a, an, an inadequate sort of... And physics is another one. There's lots of intuitive, loads of intuitive... Um, the, the, the trajectory that a, uh, if you swing a ball around your head and then you release it off at the end of a string, um, apparently there's some, some papers that, that say, you know, a fairly high percentage of university-level students um, think that the ball will follow a 
curved path. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something that they've managed to go through their entire sort of um, GCSE and A level whilst believing this, and it's not caused a yeah. problem. I think I think we all have intuitive mm -hmm. beliefs that we rely. They get us through every day. Um, they're working yeah. models. And the, these are the real deep down ingrained things that the, the science teachers just, you, you can't even imagine the sort of misunderstanding some students have. And, and, and this is the, you know, the underlying cause of, of a lot of problems. So that's effect, that's all fast tour through the, through the taxonomy. It breaks down in more detail. But, but, uh, but you find that when, it's like when you come to teach, when you come to teach something and somebody asks you questions, it unpicks the real root of your understanding. And I think that's what, through creating the videos, through presenting their understanding, through playing with it, they reveal some of these intuitive beliefs that are there so the teachers can actually deal with them. Um, sorry, there you go. So, yeah, well, we've got uh, an example. Uh, what's this one? So, the example, this is the problem that... Uh, I've got 10 minutes. <laughs> OK. This is the problem that uh, teachers of so oversimplistic calls arising. Cells contain information in order to perform their function. So they think there's some sort of innate um, aim. So it's an incomplete pre knowledge of flawed mental model of cell, cell division um, and understanding the genetic relationship between cells and an individual. And it drops down from there through to the intuitive belief that cell division occurs with some end goal in mind. So you've got cells, and this cell thinks, I'm going to be a cheek cell. So it, it becomes a cheek cell. And this cell is going to become a fingernail cell or whatever. And a lot of students have this belief. And it's, it's sort of, it's, it's underpinning their other, their other sort of learning. And un unless you drill down to find this. And if they're making a video about cells, and they might show little cells going along saying, right, I'm going to be this. And if the teacher then sees that and can drill down, it's a way of revealing their mis misconceptions. So, yeah. so very quickly, I'll work with the teachers. There's some photos which you saw in the video. Um, the teachers, we've only worked with UK teachers on identifying uh, things. And we've got uh, moles for chemistry, cells for biology, potential difference in physics. And in technology, we've worked with TU100 and the sense programming language, which is a picture of a cool sense board there. Um, and uh, yes, we've been using the taxonomy to help the teachers break these down into stumbling blocks. And we're trying to turn it into a process that does not need the presence of a researcher to support it, again, so that it can be scalable. <coughs> So these, this is, um, these are the stumbling blocks identified the, by the teachers for moles. So what is a mole? You know, apparently this, the, the concept was just too abstract for the students to grasp. Avogadro's number is this, this sort of equation. Um, that was a problem, um, largely due to under, underlying mass, but also because it's so big. Uh, molar mass, triangle, empirical formula. The, the word, the terminology, empirical. Students didn't actually fully understand what is empirical. Gas, gas volume calculations, this was one relating to underpinning knowledge because students were taught uh, at a lower level that gas will expand to fill every volume, any volume. Yet when you're starting to talk in terms of moles, it, it varies depending on the, the Avogadro's number calculation. Concentrations, reacting masses and titration. So now we get to the fun bit. Moles video. I'm going to have to do some, some behind the scenes magic here because my links don't work. But this isn't their video, this is a, some clips of the whole video. So yeah. it's, a, it's a video about the production of a Mars video. So I'll keep talking because I've got the spinning beach ball of death here. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it's called? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm called. I mean, everybody's heard of the spinning beach ball of death, haven't they? Yes. <laughs> And it comes just to the point in your presentation when you haven't got anything more to say and you just want to be able to show the video. Uh, oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Do you want to talk a bit more about that? Well, no, because okay. now is the perfect time. So this video that I would like to show you, and I had planned to show you, is um, it includes the video made by the students in Radcliffe School who um, the teacher invited them to come, and they were going to be next year's A-level students, so they, they hadn't started their A-level chemistry. Is it still spinning? Dismiss. Ah, it no, it's it. still spinning. Mm. <laughs> it's probably never going to stop spinning. Um, so they, uh, they'd been invited, they'd done their exams, they'd done their GCSEs, they'd selected chemistry for the next year's um, A-level subject. So I said, well, would you like to come along and take part in this cool Open University research project where we get to do some tabletop editing, video creation, 
um, all about moles. But to do this, uh, you're going to have to pop in for half a day and I'll teach you about moles and then we'll come along. So the students said, yeah. And um, we were expecting six to eight students. I think got 12 in the end. Mm -hmm. um, they come in, they got up at eight, you know, got into school at eight in the morning. This is after their GCSEs had finished because um, they were so interested in the whole concept. They actually gave them, so the teacher had created a um, pen cast, which is with the pen, which turned into a little video. So they almost did a sort of flipped classroom thing where the, the students um, watched the pen cast of moles the night before they came in. Uh, they'd had, had they had a pre yeah, they had a pre-lesson. They had a pre-lesson, pre and then they had the moles video um, pen cards that they could go through to make sure that they thought that they'd understood it, and then they came in and made the uh, video afterwards. You'd have thought after having a lesson and watching the video that night that they would have totally had moles of Pat, but actually some of the things, like I said, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I had to sort of quit it, so I'm, I'm not going to mess around with it too much. I'm just going to play it. This, so this is a um, video produced by Work Package 3, who are the um, performance work package, um, and it includes some of the clips from the videos so it's that not the, the student. Whole video, no, no, but the students made, and it, it's really quite, uh, quite uh, engaging. Catch Media are a specialist media company dedicated to improving lives through digital technology, participation, and creativity. Reflect. Perform. Learn. <laughs> Build a story. Rehearsing together. Don't be embarrassed. Performance can be magic. Performance can be dancing. Performance can be acting. Performance can be juggling. Performance can be singing. Performance can be teaching. Performance can be presenting. Performance is social interaction. funny even amongst the partners watching the video there was a long discussion about the fact that they'd chosen white coats to represent scientists and had they misunderstood the concept of you know was it gender biased or biased about but actually it came out from the teachers that they specifically used white coats to show um, health and safety and that they'd understood the health and safety approach to science <laughs> but it was uh, it started an interesting discussion right so this okay. Is your bit. So that, yes, I'll, I'll moving on to the, the, I'll drive the, the videos. Okay. <laughs> so moving on to that, there's some of the, and we've we've started getting videos coming back. So Spain are working with students over there. They have a nice one with um, cells and a spider mm. with a <laughs> yes, with these students hairdryer. sort of um, <laughs> cells cells react to heat. So there's this student with a hairdryer blowing this large <laughs> spider all across the floor, and another one's pulling it with a string. Really yeah. interesting, they're very creative. And so. um, the computers at the university level, the computer science students have been looking at programming. Yes, program object object oriented programming with and um, class classes inheritance of classes inheritance. Yes, where they have the most bizarre videos with little. 
um, horses <laughs> going around and little offspring coming after them. Some quite fun <laughs> ones that have come back from Spain and they're working with a local school there that they've got coming back, um, some videos from there. So there's some quite interesting stuff that's coming back. But also we wanted to sort of, amongst the partners, coming back to the pu public engagement and engaging with each other, use video to start talking to each other and communicate our understanding. So should which, we do tabletop uh, first? The tabletop video? Yes. Okay. Well, this, well, first of all, this is the ones that we produce for each other. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. We, yes, and okay. I think Russell's concerns so were we, quite... Yeah, so we had a, a remit. Um, I think that should do three, three first. first. Okay. So we had a remit to each other that we wanted to communicate our understanding of what the project was and um, um, what the project was, what our contribution to it was, um, what Juxy Land was. I thought this might be a slight risk because we just could have a load of videos that are exactly the same. I couldn't be more wrong. It really showed how different people can perceive <coughs> the same project they're working in um, and um, have even under the same remit. So um, Sweden tended to, they produced a whole load of... Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is Sweden. <laughs> Sorry. Sweden, okay. Yes, okay. It just seemed rather loud, but. So they were very focused on their workshops. So Sweden are the large screen displays one. Produce teddy bears. We did have a limit of a couple of minutes each. So then, then I think but we should. Then, um, so um, Birmingham. Birmingham, Birmingham, Birmingham yes. Place. Birmingham's is it's quite. Very different. They have a completely different concept of it. Yes, Birmingham's is quite. Which is um, very like Russell. <laughs> right. So Russell Beale's the uh, PI at uh, Birmingham. That's Russell. Here we go. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Russell from Birmingham. Uh, myself and Mina are taking. Part of the project, and we just managed to recruit a research fellow, which is the best news ever. Although she doesn't start until July, so we're bringing somebody in for uh, a couple of months. In the meantime, uh, that means we're probably not as fully up to speed with things as I would like. Uh, but it's easy to tell you about our expertise. Uh, we are focusing on uh, the HCI aspects, the human computer interaction aspects, the design aspects and the technological build of the tabletop device. Um, we have a background in design, in security, in privacy, in understanding users' needs, in creating new systems with new technologies for them. So that kind of sums up our expertise. 
how we envisage the entire project is actually what I want to chat to partners when we're there at the meeting because I'm trying to see how all the different bits fit together effectively and in particular I'm trying to understand how the pedagogic bits uh, are going to be tied in well with the video. Because one of my concerns is that Visually, or audio distraction, or other forms of distraction. <laughs> and one of the things I'm intrigued to work out is how this is going to uh, play out with mapping onto metaphors for people to actually understand text. So that's one of my um, considerations. Uh, our contributions, I think, are going to be. I think we got the best bit. Trying to no, I'm trying to stop him now. <laughs> Maybe I'll just click back and... Okay, you wouldn't believe how long we discussed, even though that wasn't sort of like a swish presentation of video, the long discussion about the whole issue of distraction, and he made his point really with quite low tech. Um, and that caused a bit of a dis consternation between him and his researcher as well, who wanted to have a flash video, but actually that got the message across, and like I said, it became one of the key videos that we discussed quite a bit around, because of this whole issue of distraction of the video and the content of it. Yes, working with schools. <laughs> the reason I've got this, that when you're working with schools and with any um, external partners, um, <laughs> You notice that they work in a very different place. This was not an analogy that I brought up. It was actually the schools who kept getting very frustrated with us because uh, they very much kept... Uh, so the, the partner at the school, um, who's on the advisory board, came up to the advisory <laughs> to our meeting and had a big picture up of a tortoise saying, that's the OU. And mainly because every time we wanted to unpick everything, understand it in great detail, and they were sort of like saying, is this going to be ready in two weeks' time? And we were like, no, we can't have everything done and finished in two weeks' time. Or when is it going to be next month? <laughs> they, they go at such a fast pace. Um, and uh, it's hard to maintain that engagement with them and the pace that they want to work at and the pace that you need to work at I think that it's a lot to do with how you communicate with them and keep them on board when you're going at the uh, tortoise in the depth level <laughs> while they're racing ahead and that was two months ago and it's gone now. So you have to really think about the, their expectations and the pace at which your partners work at. So I talk to the partners a lot, having been involved in the Catalyst project, <laughs> about we had a whole session on public engagement. So this is a bit that I wanted to talk about, about the partners and about how they perceived public engagement. So having been enthused by the Catalyst Project, I, uh, I had all the tools and had been uh, upped on public engagement and took them along to the project meeting. And uh, I had the MCC, MCP, um, um, map of all the partners, that are the potential engagement stakeholders that we could be involved in and discuss that with them and um, yes, just this through yes, the stages of research that, that we can get engaged with the part uh, with the, the public and through our research right from the beginning all the way through. Um, yes. And it went into the yes the details of the uh, the peas and um, and and ended up talking to them about who the stakeholders were. And this did cause a bit of a, uh, with some of the partners, they got quite sort of, um, this was um, forcing them on the edge of what they were happy with. Several of them, it was, it was because they felt that, really, why are we talking about, and um, talking about impact with the stakeholders and engagement, they're just the part of the people that we're engaging with to do the research. We shouldn't be thinking about that until we've got something to, to share with them. 
And so that whole thing about starting to engage with them and starting to map out who we're going to exploit this to, they really didn't want to think about it until they knew what it was that we had to almost like in a product development cycle and to sell to them. Um, and it's a, it was a big sort of shift for some of them to start, start saying, okay, well, wait a minute, what about them just being aware of the whole idea of the project? Um, before they wanted to actually have something fully formed, refined, and accurate before we started disseminating and uh, impacting on them about it. Um, but we did start to talk about um, the different stakeholders and how, how they could be involved and, and the impact on them and the process of in, impacting on them. One partner in particular, um, so uh, one of the LU um, co PIs. Literally said to all the partners, you remember this? <laughs> it was like you just sort of turned and said, come on everybody, stop being so silly and arguing about this. You know you've got to just knuckle down and deal with it, so we might as well just get on with it and deal with it now. And one of them actually admitted um, that he tried to engage the public with his research before, and um, it had been a disaster. He wasn't able to communicate effectively with the public. And he kind of, it was like an emotional, he'd given up. And so you have to realise, um, speaking about public engagement, about the, the sensitivities in engaging from the researcher's point of view of them feeling that they don't really have the skills to be able to communicate effectively. And we're trying to do it as a project as a whole. Um, um, but we did map out what the different stakeholders are, what their expectations are. Um, and how we will try to, and we're still trying to get partners to understand. Unfortunately, several of them are, unfortunately, they're still avidly focusing on scientific publications and scientific impact. And they wanted almost to get that nailed first before they went on to the public. The public happens after they've dealt with the scientific impacts. Which I suppose you can understand really. I did use this. This was an analysis that Anne, sorry, Anne, <laughs> done of our. So we have a website up, we have blogs, we have um, videos on there. And um, Anne did through the Capitalist Project a sort of like evaluation of several projects. And I did try to use this as leverage to start getting the partners to thinking about how interactive we are. And it was quite useful to start saying, mainly because I think it fitted with a lot of the, the computing people we've got, a breakdown of different tools and approaches and facilities and what it facilitated. Um, um, actually, it was the first year review and the fact that the project officer really just jumped on it and said, you, we really have, you must get exploitation sorted. And they were sort of like, yeah, but it's only the first year. And they were, they were sort of like saying, no, you must. And so it sort of motivated them forward. Um, and things like this do help because it gives something objective that they can concentrate on. I did communicate with them about uh, the Science for All approach to public engagement, uh, the transmit, receive, collaborate. But I think the thing is actually getting some of them to the hearts and minds before you can start getting into the processes. And I don't think we still haven't quite got all of the hearts and minds. They're okay about, we've, got, we've moved them forward by communicating with each other in different ways. And that's started moving them forward. And they're now... Sort of a bit, so still a bit concerned about um, social media. Um, yes. The reviewers introduced the idea of social media and, uh, you know, even at the review, um, one partner was saying, you know, we need a careful plan and uh, we had a meeting today and another partner said the same thing. They seem very concerned about social media as a, as a, as a, a channel for dissemination, which I is mean, something we've got to get to the bottom of. There was, yeah, I mean, I think it's come up from several of the partners. There's no point in us just having social media, just using social media. You need to think about what your message is through social media. You need to think about who it is that you're communicating. And we have, don't have an accurate representation, you know, accurate findings that we want to communicate to them about. And so it's, it's, it's still a sort of like bone of contention between us about, well, wait a minute, we just need to communicate and them to be aware that we're here and what your different expertise is and then wanting to communicate something that is high. They, they used to communicate at a certain level. We started, um, I started talking about um, through social media, and I've talked to Anne about this, about um, 
Dunbar's number, the actual level of um, at, um, connectivity and intimacy that you could have. This is a social um, social learning theory of um, of um, the amount that you can actually still maintain an intimate relationship with a certain number. And the next one's the one that's been more effective. Um, the ripple effect. Now, they somehow, with several of the partners, they can relate to this. Actually, understanding that there are key people that you can connect to, and that has started getting some of them to start saying, "All oh, right, okay, as long as we have a, 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 a process with social media that is approaching the accurate, appropriate people that have the right influence in an area that we think is a right area, then they're, they're, they seem to be moving forward now, having this ripple effect." And we're starting to map out, starting in the project, who are the key area, key people, key connection points. So Jill started mapping out with um, Twitter, key ripple, central ripples that can be rippled out from the <coughs> project. And, and um, with the project, we started talking about a table of impacts because we're working a lot with the project earlier on. This was another issue of uh, debate that keeps going around in circles of us collecting um, engagement and impact that we're having with partners early on. And several of them were saying, well, no, we shouldn't, even though Sweden and Portugal have said that they, they've been very surprised and they've been having impact already. They still were very reticent about actually capturing that and making logs of it. Um, we've been keeping it for ourselves because it's been having quite a, a rapid um, uh, um, impact, um, but uh, it, is, uh, it is tough, yes. And we have started mapping out this, and this distinction between the dissemination, so the academics seem to be happier in this area of dissemination, and what we said is the scientific dissemination um, sort of thread of that, and they're happy with that, and okay, working out what conferences there are to go to, and the workshops, and the scientific impact, starting to, to go down here into the sort of Social media, you can't read any of this. <laughs> Social media and into mass media, um, then they're less happy about. The social media are not as unhappy. Well, actually, probably, no, the mass media, they're sort of at the end, will disseminate to mass media. The social media, they need to know what it is they're communicating. That's what several of the partners have said before they start getting to Follow Jocks to Learn underscore EU. <laughs> <laughs> Are there people in the central ripple? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then with the exploitation, actually, I can't read this. <laughs> you can't read it here either. Let's just move on. Yeah, no, yeah. but anyway, with the exploitation, we're starting to get them to map out with the schools that they're working with, policy makers and likely decision makers in the school sector. And then um, with regard to um, impacts um, uh, for follow on funding, they seem to be quite motivated to, with regard to that. Um, yeah, I can't read half of that. Sorry, yes, sir, are there any questions? <laughs> Did we not have another video? Oh, I don't know. What would you like to share? Yeah, We've got loads of videos. We've shown lots of videos. Okay, that's Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head, you know. I thought we had another video. Maybe we shall. Uh, we probably do. Are there any questions? Sorry. Yes. I'm just kind of curious, really, because it's, it's fascinating, particularly the approach around video and stuff, but I just want to the approach to mapping that into the kind of school schedule, school timetable and stuff you mentioned about the, the just learn process. Is it, have you had any luck trying to get that into the process? Oh golly, yeah, more than we imagined. We totally thought this would be an after school. I suppose we were following on from the PI project that this should probably be after school. It's very hard to get into the curriculum. Uh, we were dealing with A-level students, so it make it a bit easier. Um, um, and the, they did have slots that we thought we'd go into, but actually the teachers so bought into it, they put it straight into the classroom time. I think possibly that could have been the fact that we worked with teachers <laughs> to start off before we start. We didn't come in with this drop-in um, method and process. We worked with the teachers to identify the threshold concepts that were important to them. And they saw it as not a sort of... Um, fun thing on the side, although the, like I said, the chemistry teachers like to do, but actually because it was tied to specific concepts and they'd broken down what the sub-concept was, it wasn't us just creating a lesson plan, it was them creating it, that it actually, they could see that it was relevant to the, the core learning. So they had it in their classes. 
Yeah. Can you get through that? Sorry, that's the question. Can you get through that iteration in 40 minutes? We, um, it was, it was a day. Yeah, but we wouldn't do a full iteration no. anyway. Mm -hmm. It's 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 bits. So the identification of the threshold concepts, that's the teacher on their own doing that. They start with examples, they think of uh, you know problems that students have. They do that, that's that sort of preparatory work. The first thing the teacher does with the students is a sort of a quiz. Now they could set the student to do this at home because it would be online, or they could have a classroom session devoted to it and then discuss the results with the students in the classroom. It's sort of flexible and then they're moving on to the creative video, storyboarding, uh, shooting and editing, that's a sort of a longer process. Again, it's flexible, you can decide when and how you're going to do it, and, and so on, and the sharing is something else. But the teacher was so bought into how good it was, he printed up just the squares of the storyboard, not one that had the broken down parts in it, And because he, he just thought somehow, if he just had the storyboard, I gave it to the students on this topic that I know is a threshold concept, um, that they would, some, and they were just like, and? Because it hadn't been broken down. So I think we've got to develop the resources so it supports it. But he was totally, oh, this, this will suddenly how, somehow produce the same thing again. If I just give them the storyboard and they map out the, the, the video that they'd be making. Um, so I think you can do it without creating a video. The motivating to create the video is really useful for the students. But you can have elements of the whole thing. Also, you could, use, you could use videos produced by another school and focus on the commenting, feedback and sharing process as a, as a learning uh, method as well. So you can use different bits of the process, depending on the resources of your school. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's partly to follow on the trip, which is, which is in which lessons you use this in, which parts of the curriculum. So if you just learn this in science, for example, you try this in other academic domains. They wanted to put it across into the whole, of, we were like, wait, they weren't the hairs, they were going, well, we can see this would be relevant to, to the whole, we should have this in maths, we should have this in, but each bit they were like bowled over by the, their pens and having pen casts and then being up there and the students being able to look at that, like each bit, you know, the storyboards, oh, that'd be great, well, we should have that across. One thing, because you, you said that, you said right at the start that part of the issue with the, the way you put the project together was there was concern that there weren't enough students doing science subjects mm -hmm. and only was taking media studies, mm -hmm. right? So would you put this in a media studies classroom? To, for them to create stuff? Well, I think it needs to be around their understanding of the science. So, so, I mean, do, do you mean are there threshold comments, are there threshold concepts in other areas of yes. Yes. knowledge in yeah. schools and you could put this into Yeah. That's I mean, well that's the whole so Maya and Land did identify they worked in lots of different areas, from sports to you know, they've done they've identified threshold concepts in lots of different areas. So did you did you do it around science because that's where the EU won the project <laughs> <laughs> We're only... No, that's fine. Yeah. That's, that's fine. But that's fine. like I said, the, the, the teachers were just like, this should be across the whole school. We should be doing it here. We should be doing that. We'll be like, oh, well, let's just get the resources sorted. Let's map out the natural taxonomy. Let's break it down first before we start rushing on. So, sorry. Yeah, uh, you may have actually answered my question, but I'll ask it again anyway in case there's more. Um, given the importance of the process in this, the actual storyboarding and the, 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 the making of the video, is there a value in the final output of the video as a long-term resource? Some of them, yes. Mm. Um, so, so it depends on the. the well, I, I would say so I would say all of them, even those over the. <laughs> well, no, because as you say, the importance is in the process, and some students may well end up with uh, a, their first cut that is actually full of um, misconceptions. Mm. Um, and then students commenting on that can highlight that. You know, a teacher could use that and say, right, here's a video of cells or whatever. Now, you know, look through it and you know, tell me what's wrong. You can use these, these resources yeah. in many different ways. I would say you don't want to throw any of them away. The students themselves may say, right, I'm going to, now I understand better. I'm going to get rid of that draft. I'm going to reshoot these shots to make it a better video. Mm -hmm. And you must allow the students the, the possibility to do that. So we did talk about, actually, the fact that video has been, and, and media has been thought of as a perfect representation. But actually, if you had the watch this in your own risk, 
this, this has inaccuracy in the zine and a sort of like identifying what was wrong in this video mm -hmm. as a resource in itself is it could be useful. But I think it's the trouble is so many people think of them as being like the BBC yes. perfect yes. representation yes. of understanding. So you have to, and we have talked about trying mm -hmm. to sort of frame it and have things around it saying these are. Yeah, this you know, is the first draft and yeah, this so, is a you know, you know, final it's got, cut. It's got naturalities in it so that people can be aware. Wow. Well, we don't have that. We don't have any student-created videos, not entire ones. We've got clips from that workshop, but we've not got through that stage because we are only in, in year one. We've started, but we haven't got. So I'm sure, as the students create their videos, we will discover, you know, how comfortable they are with putting up a, a video that they, their teacher said, oh, actually, that's not quite accurate. They go, oh, you know, they might say, no, no, I don't want it. It's, let me fix it. Um, yeah. We don't know. We'll have to wait and see. That's, it's an interesting, different way of viewing it. Sorry. Yeah, well, following on, I think it's similar. I was trying to unpick in my mind who the, uh, where the, the benefit was coming in and who uh, was receiving it. Was it the people who were involved in the process of creating the video, or was it mm. the people watching the video at the end of it? And it, it sounds very definitely as a, it's, it's the process of reflecting. And it's a reflection doing. all the way through, but it does bring in audience, and it being a different type of audience from this is a perfect. Although there's a lot of things in YouTube that are set up there and they don't say watch this at your own risk that mm. are inaccurate and they're used by some teachers who should know better than them, but these are actually inaccurate representations but they don't have that up there so maybe we ought to be a bit and another way that they're not necessarily the BBC perfect versions mm. Another way you can use the videos is during the storyboarding process as a resource, which is what we did in the workshop for the tabletop editing. So inspiration, you can watch a few YouTube videos basically or on the subject just to get ideas of what other people have done. It doesn't make students copy, we found that uh, quite clearly. It just opens their eyes a little bit as to the wealth of, of creativity that they could apply to the subject and then they go off on their own because they want to make their mark. They start having fun and playing with these things that are supposed to be I think some of them think it's almost like sacred and they're not allowed to laugh in science classes. They're not allowed to play with things. They have to just take that book and put it into their head. And so it starts to change it to be a, a fun. Uh, some of them are, they're, it's a bit of a shock to the system. Sorry. <laughs> well, following on from that, I can see perfectly how you can use the dub video as a reflective tool and all those kind of things. But have you any idea? Uh, ideas how we can actually get our students who are distance learners, uh, I'm weak on technology, but how we can get our students who are distance learners to create video together in this way, or do we have to go back to having residential schools and putting them on in the classroom? I think the benefit is in doing the whole thing from beginning to end rather than just commenting on someone else's video. I don't think that the, the key will be getting them to make their own as well, and then comment on it. Can we do that live on, on the, you know, in, a, in an illuminate tutorial? Can we do it? Well, two to one hundred have um, videos that they produce, yes. produce um, as part of their courses. Yes, yes. individuals create. Are they individual or are they group work? Because it's the group work that needs to be there. Uh, it's done as a, a shared thing. I can't exactly remember that. I'm, I'm not on the course team, so I don't know. But. Uh, but they use a derivative of open studios so that the students put up stuff there. And then edit it. People comment on them and they reverse okay. So it's a good right. work activity. The technology's there to do it. Yeah. 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 Maybe not, I mean, not as fluid as, as working. It's obviously not together, really as good as a residential going there. And, I mean, then maybe they pay extra to go to a residential or <laughs> <laughs> be the yeah. accredited yeah. on science. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Or you could do it online as an alternative. I don't know. It's, there's different possibilities. So you're going to ask a question here. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and I forgot what it was now. <laughs> uh, yeah, but part of part of this is about um, uh, making students reflect on their learning by asking them to teach somebody else effectively, yeah. which is quite an established mm. idea in, in teaching anyway. But is the video adding something different and over and above that? It, it's interesting to say that because um, several people have said. We were at part of the project, so could you could you learn just by doing the um, the storyboarding? And to some extent, you reflect a, a certain level in creating the, the storyboard and reflecting on that process. There is something that somehow it inspires them to just it motivates them to be more playful, to have to go a step further when they do create the video. It just, it just does. 
that, that they're more engaged in it. And I don't know if it's the age or whether it's just all students are. No, it's the undergraduate, the, the um, programming students at the graduate level. They just loved it and it motivated them to just really explore the deeper understanding. And actually, I think probably the video making does do that step further because it was even in the video making that they realised they misunderstood things. So yes, they mapped it all out in the storyboard, and we, they're used to sort of writing things out or even drawing it out. But when they started making the videos, they started questioning a step further, reflecting just a bit more on, have I really got that right? Is that really accurate? Do you remember there was the anecdote that, uh, was it was Episode Laura re related, where there was a group of students and they yeah. were in the process oh, of performing yeah. But, but no, you, you missed the, the middle bit. <laughs> well, the, the student who, there were two students who were narrating, and the students who were behind the camera realised that the students who were actually doing the speaking hadn't fundamentally understood the subject. And it was the teacher who reported this. So the students who were doing the filming said, oh, hang on a minute, they stopped the filming. They quickly explained the subject to the other two in their group such that they understood it. Then they went back and they were able to express it more clearly. So that was an interesting thing that, that the teacher spotted. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> Can I go back to the back of um, It's kind of following on from your point there, which is that, um, yeah, one level this is kind of like recognisable as teaching, as a means of learning, mm -hmm. but then on the other hand it's about the use of media. And I'm, I'm quite interested in the relationship between the concepts, the media, and the genres which are in play. Mm -hmm. Because coming from my field, which is academic literacy, um, there's been quite a lot of work done on what's called regenerating. So any kind of traditionally represent, well, there's not much tradition, you can't really say that anymore, but anyway, uh, the, the knowledge which is, this knowledge has all been represented somehow previously to these learners. The, these learners are now reproducing this knowledge from some previous experiences that they've had of being taught it. Mm -hmm. And in that sort of phase, that's kind of like more, more traditional schooling, now that, and, and more traditional genres. So the more radical genres, or interesting ones, is to turn something into a poem, or into a song, yeah. or into a poster. It's just a poster, yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it can be any genre. Mm -hmm. So what's my, my question here somewhere is, um, you know, to what, how powerful the media is in that genre mix? Because obviously if you're writing a poem, or even if you're doing a poster, or if you're doing um, lots of different, or you're drawing a picture, all of these are different ways of representing the knowledge, so that shifting of genres is something to do with the way that the knowledge becomes absorbed and constructed within ourselves. I'd say that the way that um, the youth is moving, with the way that they're continually videoing themselves, having little clip things that they share with each other, is that they're moving into this video, and they, they have a greater ownership of it. I don't know if creating a poem, they would feel, I don't know, but, uh, I don't know if they feel such an ownership of it, but they really do feel that they understand the creating a film, or they want to, they're motivated to own it more. And it does that sort of like a play, it takes it out of, I think the thing is if it was more of a written, a written to a written, it, they feel um, inhibited to represent it in an accurate way. And we saw this when we were working with the students first of all, is that they, they're, it's almost like sacred, a sacred book that they need to replicate and put it, when they put it into a written word, it has to be the same way and they could misinterpret it. Whereas when they start putting it into a visual um, video format that they feel a bit more comfortable with, they, they, they sort of start to play with it. And it does highlight the things that they get wrong, which is what you want them to do, but they feel more comfortable in doing that than they, I'm not certain if that's, the age group. We're just working with younger people, so whether older people would find it harder and feel more threatened to using a video, I don't know. I don't know what happens. I think TU100 is quite a young set of cohorts. I don't know. But I think definitely with the younger, it definitely they have more of an ownership to be able to play with this video. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to sort of similar thing, but, but is, the, is one of the issues uh, that if you're moving them away from a sort of conventional route of teaching into a different medium, is that they, it requires them to use a different language. And if you were saying earlier that one of the issues about threshold concepts is some sort of failure of terminology and language, mm -hmm. is, is that where the benefit's coming in? Because you're requiring them to do it in a, in a, in a way that doesn't use school speak. 
Well, to be honest, I think that that is one element of it because by using visual media to represent it, you're sort of bypassing the terminology that has been a barrier and I think uncovering the misconceptions, it's finding out what they are in order to address them it's, is, is one of the main benefits of this approach, I think. One of the interesting things that we came up um, with regard to that representing that understanding of different representations is that going back onto a large screen display, so they've created a video and they've gone into this creative medium, the large screen displays, they don't have sound, so they need to start thinking about having um, titles. So they have to go back to formalising into a written language, which is what they have to do for the exams. So it sort of forces them to sort of step out, play, <coughs> um, um, juxtapose and create things, and then they have to start going back and sort of putting in the words and to the things that they understand. So they're sort of going full circle. But it doesn't, it, it starts to get them away from what they, the, the, especially the weaker students, just literally, we had them just go, oh right, okay, right, what's the first thing we do when we're learning this? What's the definition for it? Give me the definition. And they write it down, they write it down, oh no, I've written the definition wrong. They just literally take the book, think, I've got to just shove this in here. When I go into the exam, I just regurgitate it. They don't, they don't really get that deeper understanding of it. So it does. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Is there anything else? Time. Yes. There was just this notion of a threshold concept is something that once you get it, you have your understanding is completely transformed. And it seems to me, and then what you talked about and what the videos are doing, not quite as transforming. No, definitely on that point. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm not sure I completely get what the single sort of idea that you get in biology that would make it not possible to think the same way as before. You know, there's that feeling in the literature that, mm -hmm. you know, as you have know, the last, you know, the transform type of thing, you know, but it, but it just seems to me that quite often people sort of half get concepts mm -hmm. and it, it, it fades away again. Maybe that's just me, maybe that's how I learned things. But, but I just wanted to, have, you know, if you would speculate on, you know, when you're doing a full uh, data collection and looking at the impact of the creation of the video, do you think it's going to be, you know, did it, got it, or is there going to be a more nuanced version of the story after the video? I'm not so, I know that I was quite surprised, the chemistry teacher was surprised in the partners, whether we had light bulb moments for the students, yeah. which is, I suppose, that thing yeah. of, whoa, I haven't realised I haven't got it, or lack of light bulb moments, but a light bulb moment to the teacher. Mm -hmm. What surprised us is how much the teacher hadn't understood mm -hmm. um, when they were teaching, how much wasn't getting across the communication thing of, uh, with these mm -hmm. concepts. But it did surprise us that not only were the students having these light bulb moments, and we were facilitating that. Yeah. So whether it's yeah. it's an accurate threshold concept that's been identified or it's being effectively supported, at least yeah. the thing is it's, it's causing those light bulb moments, yeah. not just for students, but for the teachers as well, on their teaching. In mm -hmm. fact, yeah. in our second workshop, the Teach the Teachers workshop, going back to, I think, one of, one of John's points, uh, no, actually, it's the chap who's just gone, um, about different media and um, the, the effect of using video <coughs> as opposed to writing a poem. One of our workshops, we had the students teach the teachers. So the students sort of prepared a little lesson plan and then they presented to the teachers. And two of the um, high ability physics students were presenting <coughs> using the whiteboard and everything. But it was that teacher who afterwards, I can't remember what it was, some um, metaphor or analogy that he'd mm -hmm. used. The students were trying to reuse it. And even though they were very, very uh, high achieving students, they were reusing it wrong. And I remember I've got a quote, he said, you know, I'm just not going to use that again. He's, he's actually going to change his practice as a result. And this is where the students weren't creating a video, but they were creating a performance. They were performing as teachers. Mm -hmm. And even that, that, riff, that still showed uh, some of the misunderstandings oh, that they had. The major thing that we've realised is that um, we, we were going for the students and, and developing the process to support the student understanding. And a massive thing has been around the teachers and their practice and supporting them in, in breaking down into because they were teaching to the exam. 
into conceptual understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. even working with John, he was saying, I can't understand what the students don't oh, understand. Yes. So even at, at the, at the mm -hmm. level here, I think mm -hmm. there's a, it's useful for, for courses to start thinking conceptually. Sorry, you could go. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.